Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on The First Citizen. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to see how Octavian decides to manage his sole control of the Roman world. So, we're going to start by setting the scene, figuring out how we got to this point, then we'll talk about Octavian's ascent from being the kind of nephew of Caesar to his adoptive heir, all the way to the leading person in the Roman world. We'll take a look at recapping the end of civil war and then figure out how Octavian is kind of seen as this prudent politician who can manage everything to make both the Senate and the people and himself happy. And then finally, we'll look at the strategies that he uses to legitimize himself as Rome's first emperor. So let's go ahead and figure out how we got here. It all begins, of course, long before the city of Rome was ever founded, back in the early Iron Age, when for hundreds of years, Rome was kind of, or the, the Italian peninsula was comprised of a large diversity of tribes, the most powerful and successful and sophisticated of which were, of course, the Etruscans. Now, Rome itself was founded in 753 BC by Romulus, and for the next 250 years, uh, Rome was ruled by a series of seven kings. And while Romulus and Numa Pompilius start out as really good dudes, Tarquin the Proud at the very end was very much not a good dude. And because of that, we see Lucius Junius Brutus overthrow the, uh, the monarchic government in, uh, in 509 BC, instituting the Roman Republic. Now, the guiding ideology of the, Re the Roman Republic is that no single person should rule. That power should be shared by elected officials and by the people, and even at the highest levels of government, right, the consulships. You always have two consuls at any given time, and they only rule for a year. And the idea here is that if you get a bad apple, A, they're balanced out by the other consul, and B, even if they both stink, they're out of there after a year. So that's the guiding ideology, no kings in Rome, and it's been like that for 500 years since the beginning of the Republic. Now, on the Ides of March 44 BC, we get the assassination of Julius Caesar by the senators, including Marcus Junius Brutus, Caesar's good friend. And this is really important kind of symbolically, not just because he was Caesar's good friend, but because it's his great, 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 great grandfather, Lucius Junius Brutus, who ended up kicking out Tarquin the Proud, the last king of Rome. And so symbolically, right, the Brutuses or the Brutii, right, they're seen as these kind of tyrant slayers. And it was said that after the assassination, Brutus says, six semper tyrannis, right? And so it will always be with kings. They will always be assassinated. Now, it turns out that they won't always be assassinated. And we'll see that Caesar's adopted heir, Octavian, is actually able to rule essentially as a king for about 40 years. But let's see how we get there. So after Caesar's assassination, the Senate places their faith in Caesar's adopted heir, Octavian, and they think that he'll be able to put up a good fight against Mark Antony, and then they'll be able to kind of wrest power back away from him. And while they team up right at the very beginning, Octavian then flips on the Senate. He ends up taking control of the treasury, and he ends up rescinding the amnesty for uh, Caesar's assassins. He then goes ahead and teams up with Mark Antony, and together with Lepidus, they form the second triumvirate, and they battle it out with the senators for control of the Roman world. And at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC, they're able to defeat the senatorial resistance, and then they decide to govern by splitting up the empire. So Octavian takes the Roman West, Italy and Spain and Gaul. Antony takes the Roman East, Macedonia and Greece and Asia and Egypt. And poor little Lepidus is left with North Africa. Nobody cares about Lepidus. So eventually, Lepidus rebels against Octavian, and uh, Octavian's able to defeat him, taking North Africa. And then the final battle between Octavian and Mark Antony occurs in 31 BC at the site of Actium in northwestern Greece. It's a naval battle. Octavian's able to basically trap Antony's ships against the coastline. And uh, Antony and Cleopatra flee the battle go back to Egypt and end up committing suicide. Now, this is kind of great because it, it temporarily brings civil war to an end. Octavian's won the civil war, right? He's the last man standing. And so at this point in time, Octavian rules the Western Roman world, he rules the Eastern Roman world, and he rules North Africa. So Octavian rules the entire thing. 
The Senate's not particularly powerful right now. They were really kind of laid low at the Battle of Philippi, and he has nobody left to challenge him. So, let's see how we got to the end of this civil war. This marks the third, the end of the third of three different civil wars. The first, of course, was between the Populares hero Gaius Marius and the Optimates hero Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And with them, we see the first time in history where Roman generals use Roman armies to march on the city of Rome. We're getting full-blown civil war. And at the Battle of the Colline Gate in 82, we see uh, Sulla bring his army back from the east and slaughter like 50,000 supporters of Marius. That doesn't settle things though, and we see a couple decades later, Julius Caesar go up against one of the great military heroes of ancient Rome, Pompey the Great, and we see that at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC, Caesar, even though he's outnumbered two to one in terms of infantry and five to one in terms of cavalry, he's able to kind of spring a surprise attack on, uh, on Pompey, winning that battle, forcing Pompey to flee and eventually be killed on the shores of Egypt. And then the third set of civil wars is between Octavian and Mark Antony. And while they're teammates at first and they're able to defeat the senators at Philippi, they end up turning on each other and it's that Battle of Actium in 31 that gives Octavian sole control of the Roman world. Now here's the issue, right? None of the real problems have been fixed, right? A big reason this is happening because there's intense aristocratic competition for prestige and money and military glory, and you get that prestige through fighting, okay? So that hasn't been fixed, uh, and even though kind of we have different victors along the way, they, they don't deal with that issue. The other problem we have is the loyalty of the army. We see that beginning with Marius's reforms to the army, as it becomes a professional thing where people are getting paid and getting retirement benefits and getting armor and weapons and things like that, somebody needs to supply those. And it falls on the general to do that supplying. And so when you're a soldier and when your kind of financial well-being is tied to how well you do in battle, you become much more loyal to the general than you do to the idea of Rome. And then finally, we have socioeconomic issues in the city of Rome. We get a lot of slave influx from these victories uh, into the city. People need jobs, people need food, and uh, that hasn't been solved either. So let's look at how Octavian's going to start addressing these things. The first thing we want to look at is something known as the, the First Settlement, or the First Augustan Settlement, and this happens in 27 BCE. So a few years after the Battle of Actium, Octavian's kind of been in control for a few years, and what he does is he gets together with the Senate, and rather than trying to kill them all, or rather than trying to disband the Senate, or rather than try to crown himself king, what Octavian does is symbolically restore the Republic. He gets in front of them and he says, I'm restoring the Republic, and I'm restoring the power and the prestige to you senators. All right? And the basic idea here is that Octavian is going to kind of keep the form, right? Keep the senatorial form while changing the underlying substance. And so what the Senate does in return is that they give him kind of a series of titles and they basically give him absolute power, even though on the surface, they're the ones with power. Now, Octavian declines the position of dictator, right? Remember, Julius Caesar had taken that position of dictator for life. As had, Sulla, as had Sulla several decades before. But Octavian declines the dictatorship. He doesn't want that. He already is the imperator. And that's, of course, where we get our word emperor. When we say the Roman emperors, we're talking about the Latin word imperator. So he already was that, and that translates, really in, in Latin, it translates to commander, right? Rather than emperor the way we think of it, like a monarch, it translates as a military commander. And he takes the title uh, of princeps. All right? And what princeps means is literally the first citizen. Okay? Uh, so if you've ever heard that Orwellian quote, right? we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. Right? All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. This is very much what's going on here. Octavian's saying he's a citizen. He's just the first citizen. And he also accepts another honor that was bestowed upon him by the Senate. And that's the title of Augustus. So at the beginning, Augustus is a title rather than a name, and it very literally means the revered one. But later on, Octavian ends up basically building this into his name. 
And so his new kind of name ends up being Imperator, Caesar, Divi Filius Augustus, right? Which very literally translates as Commander Caesar Augustus, son of the divine. And so what you end up seeing here is he's being really clever, right? He's declining things like the dictatorship. He's saying, I am not a god, but you know what? My father, Julius Caesar, we'll call him, we'll say he was a god, all right? So he's, he's declining his own divinity while at the same time saying that he's, he's descended from divinity. So in the kind of end, what ends up happening is that everybody is just bloody sick of war, all right? They've been fighting against each other for a hundred years. And Augustus is smart enough to say, hey, on the surface, let's give the Senate the power, all right? In reality, I'm in control of everything. And so that's what ends up happening that starts to bring, pre starts to bring peace to the Roman world. So, how do you get people to buy into this new way of doing things? Remember, for 500 years, the prevailing ideology of the Roman Republic is that there are no kings, right? There's no single ruler. And now after 500 years, we have a single ruler, right? And he's trying to say on the surface, this is not the case. He's actually got a co-consul, right? So he's got a co-consulship with uh, Marcus Agrippa at the very beginning. And so how else does he kind of legitimize himself as ruler while at the same time not doing so in such an overt way that he comes off like a king? So one of the things the new uh, Emperor Augustus does is he starts to think about what the problems were that led to the civil wars. Now him along with these kind of philosophers and writers around this time suggests that one of the things that led to military conflict was actually a moral problem. And so Augustus passes a series of laws that we call the Lex Julia that mandate moral reform. And the idea here is one of them that says, if you're unfaithful and a woman, this doesn't apply to men, all right, uh, but infidelity by women is harshly now punished. We also see that for men, the kind of counterpart of this is that if you're a young man and you don't get married, you're also punished, right? He makes these things really illegal. And the idea here is that this is supposed to build family ties and increase the size of Roman families. Kind of build on this, he ends up taking the position of Pontifex Maximus. So remember that Julius Caesar had this same position. So now in addition to being kind of Rome's premier political leader, he's also their premier religious leader. And one of the things he does as Pontifex Maximus is he starts reinstituting some of the old religious festivals, right? So it's this kind of idea that if we can just get back to the way religion used to be, we'll end up being better off morally. Now, along with that comes a series of like games and things like that. Gladiatorial games and festivals are very closely associated with uh, religious holidays. And so that's something that in addition to getting back to kind of the old religious way of doing things, he's also putting on things that people really like. And some of this kind of religious reform is best exemplified in what we're looking at here. This in Latin is known as the Ara Pacis, all right, or the altar of peace. And this was amazingly found in the city of Rome, almost complete. So it's a monumental altar where sacrifices would be made. And the iconography of the whole thing basically shows Augustus bringing peace to the Roman world. And we'll see that he's ushering in an era that we actually call the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. And so this is to commemorate an end of the civil wars and the beginning of a time of peace and prosperity in the Roman world. He also initiates an imperial cult, all right? And the idea here is to kind of bring people closer to the imperial family. Now remember that Augustus doesn't say that he himself is divine, all right? He's not saying that he's a god, at least not publicly, all right? But he does say that Julius Caesar can be worshipped. Right? That Julius Caesar can be considered a god. And Caesar could then, right, remember he was trying to trace his lineage way back to Iulus, the kind of progeny or the progenitor of the Julii clan, whose father was Aeneas, whose father was Anchises, who hooked up with Venus or Aphrodite. And so Julius Caesar kind of links his way all the way back to the gods and eventually wants himself to be worshipped. So, Augustus also goes on a building plan. So next to the Roman Forum, the main Roman Forum, we saw that Julius Caesar built his own little forum, and Augustus does the same thing, and that's what you're looking at here, the Forum of Augustus. 
And as the centerpiece of the Forum of Augustus, we get the Temple of Mars Ultor, all right? And what that translates as is Mars the Avenger. Now, who do you think Mars, the god of war, is avenging? Well, of course he's avenging, right, the death of Caesar. And so this is kind of put up in commemoration of his assassinated father. And one of the cool kind of things here is that you can see some of the ancient columns. You can see the, uh, the podium on which the temple was built. But this back wall is all original and ancient Roman as well. And you can actually see in there where the ceiling of the temple kind of used to be. Now, right after the Battle of Actium, after Augustus takes sole control of the Roman world, we see that he starts a building project for his own tomb. And we call this the Mausoleum of Augustus because in form it's similar to what was going on with the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus. And so this is a monumental tomb and you can still see it in Rome today. And outside of that tomb, he puts up what we call the Res Gestae, or the Deeds of the Divine Augustus. And what this is, is it's a monumental inscription that lists all the great things that Augustus did for the Roman people throughout the Roman world. So he puts this up outside of his tomb so that it can be remembered what he did, but he also puts it up all across the empire so that people far and wide know who kind of brought peace to the Roman world and kind of what the great things are that he did. So even in statuary, we end up seeing Augustus try to send a message of kind of all the great things he does and his legitimacy to rule. And so what you're looking at here is a statue called the, uh, the, the Prima Porta Augustus because of where it was found. So it's one of the best preserved statues of Augustus, and it's known as the Prima Porta because uh, it was found near that gate in Rome. And you can see a couple things here, right? So in addition to Augustus being the military leader, you can see this tiny little baby right here. And what kind of tiny little baby has wings? Well, of course, that's Cupid, okay? And any idea who Cupid's mother is? Why, of course, that's Venus or Aphrodite, all right? Who links all the way back to Caesar's great, 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 great grandmother. And so we can also see in him riding a dolphin, one of the symbols of Venus or Aphrodite. So very subtly, he's linking himself to the divine in this statue. And when we zoom in on the cuirass or breastplate here, we can see him sending another message. So what we see here is Augustus on the left, and on the right we see the Parthian king. So one of the expeditions that Augustus goes on is he heads out east to that place where Crassus, 50 years earlier, got the whole Roman legion destroyed. Remember, Crassus was beheaded and he lost the Roman standards, that thing with the eagle on top that stands for the power of Rome. And so Augustus heads out there, he's able to defeat the Parthians, and in doing so, as they surrender, he's able to regain the standards of Rome. And so he's commemorating that on the breastplate, so even something as, as simple as the iconography on his armor is showing his legitimacy to rule the, the, the city and, and kind of larger world of Rome. We see it in literature as well, right? So a lot of our sources that we have for the earliest days, Virgil's Aeneid, Livy's History of Rome. These things are written during the time of Augustus. He's, he basically says that we need kind of the literature to back up how great we are in the world. And at the same time, these pieces of literature are also kind of justifying his right to rule the Roman people. So even though Livy tells us the kind of most detailed story about the early days of Rome, he's writing during the time of Augustus. Even though Virgil talks about how it was Aeneas who fled Troy, eventually ending up on the shores of Italy to later uh, kind of have his, his progeny found the city, that's written during the time of Augustus. So it's meant to glorify Rome as well as establish Augustus as the rightful leader. Now, he also, in addition to all these kind of ideological things, right? Those are kind of ideological things, things like the Temple of Mars the Avenger, this kind of symbology on the breastplate, uh, of Augustus, he also does a series of practical things that are just flat out good for the Roman people. So one of the things he does is he links the Roman treasury to the provincial treasury, right? So he's basically taking the kind of um, monetary network and linking it all across the empire. And what this does is it enables kind of large scale, long distance trade, and it enables to do that with like a reduction of transaction costs. 
Now you don't have to test the money that comes from a different place to see, it's, see if it's of the same purity as you have in Rome. It's all essentially the same. We also see him start a state-run fire brigade and a state-run police force. Not really quite the same we have today, but at least there's some kind of fire and police departments. Now you don't have to worry about people like Crassus showing up at your door, setting your apartment on fire, and then trying to buy the land from you at a super discount cost. He ends up building things that the people like. So what we're looking at here is the theater of Marcellus. And Marcellus uh, was one of his kind of minor relatives and friends. Um, and he puts up this permanent theater in the center of Rome. The space had actually been cleared by Julius Caesar. And then it's Augustus who ends up inaugurating it. And what Roman citizen doesn't like going to a show? He ends up increasing the number of people who received the grain dole. So remember, this was started way, way, way back by Gaius Gracchus, the subsidy of grain. And now people are actually getting grain um, at a subsidized price or sometimes even for free. And he ends up increasing the number of people who get that by about 33%. And so again, kind of famine or uh, high grain prices were a major problem. And this does in large part to help reduce that issue. So remember that kind of at the end of the civil wars, after the, the senators um, are defeated by the second triumvirate, Rome breaks up with Octavian in the west, with Antony in the east, and with Lepidus in North Africa. But after a series of wars with Lepidus in 36 BC in North Africa and against uh, Antony at 31 BC in Actium, Octavian becomes the sole ruler of the Roman world. Now, let's go ahead and think of some uh, concluding thoughts here, all right? One is that this is kind of problematic. For 500 years, the ideology has been no kings in Rome, no single ruler. And all of a sudden, you've got a single ruler in Rome. So how do you deal with that? Well, one of the things that you do is that you play nicely with the, the way things used to be. All right? And so the basic idea here is that Augustus or Octavian changes the, uh, the substance of things while keeping the kind of form of things. Right? So he keeps the Senate uh, in the public's eye, he still, elects, he still has consuls elected. Everything on the surface runs as, as kind of it used to be. But in reality, the Senate has given Octavian, in addition to the title of Augustus, most of the real actual power, all the power uh, to kind of lead armies, that sort of thing. Now, in addition to kind of just having that power, you've got to tell the people that you are the rightful person to rule. And he does that through a series of kind of reforms. Some of them are ideological, changing these moral laws, setting up a monumental altar to the idea of Roman peace. Some of them are very uh, kind of practical, all right? And things like the, the grain dole, things like building theaters, things like um, setting a common currency across all the Roman world, these are things that make people's lives practically better uh, on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. And so this is how we see the Republic turn into an empire led by the first citizen.